Hey hey, it's JK, and welcome to the Dark Souls 3 Mega Archery Run. Today, we'll beat Dark Souls 3 using only bows in New Game, then using only crossbows in New Game Plus, and then finally using only great bows in New Game Plus Plus. What, you wanted more of an intro? Do you know how much we've got to cover here? Of course, I've never used any archery tools in the game before, so this is going to be interesting. The only other rule is that I must purposefully not get the Hawk or Leo rings at any point. Yep, I definitely made that rule up at the start and didn't just forget to get them across all three playthroughs. Yeah. I give our character a name related to the run as usual. Let me know if you get the reference in the comments below and I might reply with a nice compliment that'll make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. I choose the Thief starter class as it's the only one that starts with a bow. The short bow is not the best, but hopefully it will at least get us through this initial section. Now, we actually cannot buy any arrows before beating Gundir, so these 30 are all I've got to work with. I didn't want to risk killing any enemies here, as I didn't know if 30 arrows would be enough to take down you Dexter's lab. I decided to try the weapon art of the bow, Rapid Fire, to blast Gundir with arrows, but the damage was terrible. It actually seemed like 30 wasn't going to be enough, but then I noticed something. Normal shots did a lot more damage, so the weapon art sacrifices damage for speed, Unfortunately, I'd wasted too many arrows now, so I had no choice but to delete my character and restart the run. What a great start here. On this try, I was very cautious as even firing the normal way, I needed to hit him with 25 of my 30 arrows to secure victory. After one of the longer Gundir fights in recent memory, I managed to pull off a narrow win. At Firelink, I put a couple of levels into decks, but saved half my souls to buy arrows. Also, guess what? It seems inventory limits are back once again. We can still hold 99 arrows, so it's not as restrictive as the throwing knife run at least. From that first fight, we can ascertain that the short bow is not great, but luckily we can grab the long bow from right here in High Wall of Lothric. Better damage, better range, bow money, bow problems. I booked it through, grabbing poppable souls and another titanite shard to let me upgrade the long bow to plus one. It's still not giving me much damage here though. I grabbed the Esther Shard and the Cell Key before running down to free Blue Hat from his cell. Speak faster, damn it! Come on! Well, at least he's back at Firelink now, ready to sell his standard arrows. They cost twice as much and do about 25% more damage. That doesn't feel like a good deal. With all the Esters put into health, it was time to pretend I was one of the boys and prepare to take down Vort. Damage equals bad, but at least I had decent ammo compared to Gundir, so that's something. The rate of fire feels pretty slow from normal shots, and I'm still hesitant to use the weapon skill given the reduced damage. I did take some hits here and it was a bit close, but I managed to turn this watchdog from Boreal to Boreal. How many times do you think that joke is getting cracked in this video? After a cheeky level up and grabbing some ragged piece of cloth, I get carried down to the undead settlement. From here, I grab Royal Knight Loretta's bone, an Esther's shard, and an ember. I then tried to speak to my good buddy Sigurd, but this guy just wouldn't leave us in peace. Thankfully, he hadn't learned to walk onto elevators. I made friends with the best bow bro in the land and then helped Sigurd take down this demon with ease. This route after has Flynn's ring and the Claranthia ring. I wasn't sure the former would actually increase our damage, but bow and lehold, it does. After another level up, I press on to Farron Keep, easily ladder cheesing these guys. I started putting out the fires, and these guys tried so hard to climb after me that they broke the space-time continuum. Finally, I got my prize, the Dream Chaser's Ashes. Not just useful for the Titanite shards the Shrine Maiden now sells, but also the composite bow she adds to her inventory. I buy all the shards I can and get the composite bow upgraded to plus three. I now put out the other fires in Farron Keep, but decide to take on the Crystal Sage before the Abyss Watchers, as this is probably going to be more annoying. And I was right. Doesn't help when the arrows miss the clones. The first phase is actually fine. You can just spam arrows and it actually stun locks the sage so they can't attack. For phase two, taking out the clones is essential as firing the bow locks me into place, which is not ideal when magic is being spammed from all sides. But with the clones gone, it's just a matter of waiting for the right moment to start the arrow spam again and then repeat the process as it teleports again. It's pretty annoying as I'm being too shot by the magic attacks. Also, Rapid Fire doesn't stagger the Sage if you're wondering why I'm not using that. With enough patience, the boss goes down and we unlock the Passage to the Cathedral of the Deep. After spending way too long debating which arrows to buy, I decide to level up first and then grab some large arrows. 
I then killed these elder grooves with a nice bit of cheese. Let's call it Gruda. They drop Faris' hat for appropriate fashion and the black bow of Faris for long range shots which I upgrade to plus three. I proceed to Cathedral of the Deep, taking out these guys along the way. I'm still not feeling especially great about our damage, especially with what the next boss is. I mostly just legged it through here, but I did stop to easily kill the giant who couldn't touch me from this vantage point. Not sure if I'll need it, but I grab Lloyd's sword ring anyway and drop down grabbing souls, a large titanite shard, and unlocking the shortcut before getting myself some more fashion with the Drang armor. Patches has crossed me for the last time, so I have a long drawn out fight with him before winning and then returning Onion Bro's armor. Although I had unlocked access to the Deke heads, I had a feeling I would need to come back and I was totally right. I'm gonna need way more damage to pull this off. Four shots to kill one Deacon with this fire speed is not a good time. This fight is always the absolute worst for range builds or any time you need to use lock on. I need to get the bow upgraded and the first step towards that is getting large titanite shards which are mostly behind the abyss watchers. The damage we do is kinda abysmal and the first phase is pretty hectic to keep track of both watchers and find the time to shoot. The dodge shot is pretty quick but does even less damage so it's a trade off. I kept focusing on just the main one and kept dodging as much as possible waiting for openings. Phase 2 was actually kinda easier because we had just one enemy to keep track of although the attacks have surprising range here so it's easy to get caught. The big jump attack is the best opportunity to heal or attack but the quick dodge shot was also mega useful here. It was a slow fight but this Artorius fanboy didn't watch his health and one final arrow brings an end to this one. I had one mission in the catacombs of Carthus book it through as quick as possible. I took out the archers with relative ease, those speedy dodge shots really helping, and even took out this one with a hat. I made sure to grab any large titanite shards on the way, got to the bonfire, and then unfortunately found that it's not possible to break the bridge with arrows. This didn't stop some of the skeletons from just leaping off into the abyss, but a veritable chunk of them still caught up to me, and I was, in a word, boned. After further testing, I confirmed it definitely wasn't possible, so used a left jab to knock the bridge down. Still feel like a sharp pointy arrow would probably work better than my fist in real life, but oh well. Going down here was essential, as I needed to grab all the large titanite shards this area has to offer. I killed the worm, opened the shortcut, and grabbed the last few large titanite shards I needed to get my bow up to plus 6. As I'm here anyway, I might as well fight the old demon king. We can actually shoot him in the face at the start, and our damage is not bad. This boss really has very little in the way of handling ranged attacks, so running away and taking one or two shots is an amazingly viable strategy. His big explosion at the end is a joke for range builds because he just sits there taking hits. This demon was downgraded to an F mon and we've got a nice chunk of souls to level up with. We quickly move on to play a game of Where's Walnir? Oh, there he is. I thought this was going to be pretty annoying honestly, but the arrows broke his wristbands in surprisingly few hits. Managing to actually hit them versus hitting his arm is another story and the last one took a while, even had to just stand close and free aim at one point, but finally this felaton scale back into the darkness. Now this just leaves the deacons, but I still don't feel too confident about my damage. So there was only one thing for it, I shot this woman in the head, causing her to emerge and this caused Dancer to descend for a scrap. Beating Dancer will mean access to a lot of titanite chunks, but at this point I do get two shot by most of her attacks. To help counter this, I bought Lloyd's shield ring and finally decided to get some stronger arrows, the large arrows, at five times the cost of standard ones for a grand total of 10 points more damage. I estimate it will take about 40 arrows or so to get the job done. You'd think that Dancer wouldn't be so bad because she doesn't really have any ranged attacks, but the difficulty is the arena. Dancer can close the distance very quickly and you should never underestimate the range of certain attacks that she does. It was a slow fight and I was pretty much always one fluffed dodge away from death. I basically waited for certain attacks like the jump which I could definitely punish. After enough patience and a few attempts, my efforts bore real fruit and Dancer falls. I grabbed a good chunk of level ups and then proceeded past this extremely impractical entry contraption. Seriously, who designed this? I headshotted this knight who was so angry about it that he proceeded to break the boundaries of reality and then went about grabbing all the chunks in the garden followed by all the ones up in Lothric Castle so I could finally upgrade the composite bow to plus 9. Time for the deacons. Now that's what I'm talking about. With Lloyd's sword ring I can one shot the smaller ones when I'm at full health. 
The first phase was way better because at worst it was two hits to kill each one. But then phase two started. The fireball spam here gets ridiculous and interrupts my shots a lot. I could have used alluring skulls, but I really wanted to do it at least this first time without. As well as all of that, I really didn't want to get cursed right at the end, so I needed to make sure to take out these chanting guys also. Trying to get even a single hit in on the main one was painful, and I started to run really low on flasks from the constant hits. I really thought I was going to die here, but I had one ember left which I think saved me big time. I got aggressive near the end, and thankfully, I managed to get some final shots in to bring this super annoying boss down. This one left some deep scars on me, not going to lie. With that done, we can head into Irithyll, where I put down this dog first try. Yep, first try. We activate the bonfire, snipe this knight beautifully, and then proceed up the death stairway. The dodge shot is a real lifesaver here, and being able to snipe the spellcasters is also great. With the shortcut now opened, I invest in some poison arrows as I feel like they might be useful in the coming fight. And they sort of were? It took actually over half of Pontith's health bar to actually get the poison activated, and that was with me constantly shooting. Shame I choked at the end here though. But the good news is that next time it was even worse because I died here and during my death animation the poison finished off Pontiff. On my third go, I used the black bow of Faris to smash poison arrows in on Pontiff from a distance at the start. I switched to the composite bow and by the time he summoned the shadow we had his health at about 25%. In this phase, our shots often hit the shadow instead of Pontiff, but if we missed, the poison should still eventually take him out. With a few clutch shots at the end, our foe was at last Sully vanquished. On the way up to Anolondo, I cheesed this guy, but this guy had bigger aspirations so I had to arrow him instead. Once up in Anolondo, there's not much to speak of apart from these guys volunteering to help me with target practice. Aldrich, devourer of arrows, is supposedly weak to fire, but because split damage is trash, the normal arrows did more anyway, so I wasted my money. The main difficulty here is the homing projectiles making it difficult for me to find a time to fire off a full power arrow. Also, his slender body means sometimes he moves slightly and the arrows miss. But otherwise, this isn't too bad and I actually use the rapid fire weapon art at the end to finish it. Toss a coin to your old richer, or in this case, an arrow. On my way down to the dungeon, I was invaded by Dark Souls 2, who was angry that I still haven't done the all magic run. I will get to it, I promise, leave me alone. After killing some monstrosities across the dungeon, I grabbed the cell key, lured this rat into a hole, and activated the profane capital bonfire. Now I had set up Sigurd in case I needed him for Yorm, but I decided to try myself first. The results were pretty surprising actually. Thanks to the lock on point on Yorm's head, you can pop him right in the head if you time your shot right. The best times are after he does the two handed machete slam, and when he's walking, not running, towards you. After enough headshots, he staggers and any arrows shot at the head here do nearly 1000 damage. It was a long fight, clocking in at 15 minutes, and the opportunities to hit the head become much less in the second phase. I got impatient at points and paid for it. Towards the end I had no flasks left, but managed to get a stagger and the shots to the head finished off this formidable opponent. So the next stop is Dragon Slayer armor, and once again, despite being supposedly weak to fire, the fire arrows did less damage than the normal ones. But even then, the damage wasn't great, and his shield means it's easy to miss. This one is going to be tricky, and I'm wondering if I can improve my chances somehow. It was around this time, I remembered one other bow I had not tried, the Dragon Rider bow. This bow, when upgraded, apparently has the highest damage of any bow in the game, but it requires Titanite scales to upgrade. It's also heavier than the composite bow, so I had to play around with my setup. I could upgrade it to plus one, but I needed more Titanite scales. So, I grabbed some that I'd missed from this crystal lizard beast in Farron Keep, and also a bunch here in Lothric Castle. I used the scales to upgrade the Dragon Rider bow to plus four. Now, there's already an issue I'm noticing here. The damage is better, but this bow does not have the ability to fire the dodge shots, which have actually been very helpful in the run so far. The firing rate generally seems very slow with this, but that extra damage is definitely helping. My strategy for this is basically just run away from his attacks and wait for openings like after the three hit combo, or after the running shield slam. With a few more well-timed shots, this iron entity gets sent to the Armorg. With access to the Grand Archives, we can get an easy Titanite slab by pulling this lever here to open this secret area here to find a chest containing one. I also grab White Rat's ashes as I sent him here earlier. This isn't relevant now, 
but it's very important in the next cycle, so I wanted to familiarize myself with where I needed to go find them. Now, it was just a long run up the stairway of death, and then a quick lift ride down where I get some titanite chunks and embers for some reason. With the titanite slab underneath the lift, plus the one I grabbed earlier, I got both the Dragon Rider bow and the composite bow up to maximum upgrade. Before we take on the princes though, we have some other business of the slimy dragon tosser variety to handle. Tosseros was an important boss in this part of the run because it caused me to make a decision. Despite the extra damage the Dragon Rider bow was doing, the fire speed was just too slow and the lack of dodge was too detrimental to make the extra damage worth it, especially with Mr. No wind up charge here. So I switched back to the composite bow for now. This made the fight a lot easier and on my second attempt, after some perilous dodges, this king gets consumed by arrows. Pressing forwards, we get the path of the dragon gesture and also enter the untended graves. Champion Gundir is our next obstacle and if I thought the dodge shot was useful for Osiris, it was actually even more useful here given how aggressive this dude is. My main damage in this fight came from these shots. That's not to say this was easy and I certainly did eat some mid-air kicks from the big guy but as we always say with our bow build, we're always outmatched but never outgunned here. The last few shots bring him down. I then decide to find my inner peace through meditation, focusing my chakra to find my center but somehow end up in a hellish place filled with angry snake men. A few well placed arrows end there as salt and the ancient wyvern, well look if you watch the Dark Souls 3 magic video I did, you pretty much know exactly how this is going to go. Stand right here and shoot away, it's pretty slow and boring but incredibly safe, we say byvern to this wyvern. I did also try to shoot out the second wyvern in the same way but he was too clever for it and then these rock lizards gave me a warm welcome. I assume they're unhappy with me killing all their little crystal brothers. As there was a titanite slab up here, I thought I might have a go at Havel. The damage was pretty much what you would imagine, but at least I can fairly reliably get dodge shots in on him. It was a slow process, but in the end, he goes down and drops some useless equipment that I'll never use. With Havel beaten, I ring the first bell and now onto Quayla. Oh, so sorry, wrong game. Nameless Gwing was our true next opponent, and for this one, I felt more confident to use the Dragon Rider bow as the attacks are slower and it also felt thematically appropriate. Shooting the head in phase 1 was absolutely no issue whatsoever. Phase 2 began with me underestimating the range of his charge, which was not a mistake I'd make again. Nameless has this quirk that quite a few Dark Souls 3 bosses have where if you use the ranged attacks you can often just fire a shot, walk backwards a bit, fire again and repeat. Sometimes you can do this for multiple shots before they actually attack you. Things did get slightly hairy when I misdodged the lightning strike, but I recovered. I also got caught by the grab when he had a tiny amount of health left and somehow it didn't kill me even though I wasn't at full health. Despite sloppy play, I managed to get those last few hits in and bring down Nameless King on my second attempt. Maybe I should have stuck with a composite bow. Anyway, I get some more level ups with the souls I gained and now it's time to take on Lothric and Morty. Remember what I said earlier about fighting Nameless King from range? Well, Lorien gets hit even worse by this strategy. Phase 1 is easy as a result, just create distance and fire intermittently while walking backwards. Phase 2 though is tough for ranged builds. I don't fancy getting in close to try and shoot Lothric from behind because of how quickly he can counter. So instead, I use the same strategy as Phase 1 to bring down Lorien and then get as many hits in as I can to Lothric once Lorien is down. I opted for the Dragon Rider bow here just because I felt the extra damage would be really important. One thing it's really important to do is not land the shot that kills Lorien as they start bringing out the projectiles or it completely ruins the chance to damage Lothric. Thankfully, I have enough damage and ammo to get the job done here and surprisingly this boss goes down on first attempt. Our progress has been pretty good and we can hopefully see off the base game. With the ashes placed, the firekeeper works her magic and we're off to fight the soul of Cinder. Now, I actually initially made this harder on myself than it needed to be. You see, before coming here, I farmed some souls to buy arrows and I completely forgot to remove my farming equipment which made me slower and also reduced the damage buff I got from Flynn's ring. So, mid fight, I stripped off everything apart from my hat, changed my ring, somehow survived and with a bit of patience and a lot of completely not cowardly running away, we get through phase 1. Phase 2 is easier to be honest. There's less attacks to worry about and the multi-hit combo is basically free damage with a ranged build. With the last few shots fired, we win the fight to become the sole survivor, or at least until we set ourselves on fire shortly afterwards. 
But of course, it's not time for the next cycle yet. We touch a crusty scrap of paper this old man offers us and get warped away to a winter wonderland full of spear-throwing knights, perilous platforming, archers, fire breathers, and of course, who can forget that one pretty crappy boss they seem to have in every DLC. This time, it's an NPC who loves nothing more than relentlessly dodging projectiles. For this again, the composite bow was an absolute must. Because of this, I actually found it worked out better to kill the giant wolf first as it was an easy target. Now, I could solely focus on the grave tender who could even dodge my dodge shots which seemed insane. Thankfully, he starts shooting magic at some point which does tender to leave him vulnerable to being put in a grave. This was a long and pretty annoying fight and it's quite evident that it's probably not going to get easier in the later cycles. I thought Wilhelm would be similarly annoying but weirdly, compared to the other NPC fights in the game, he doesn't seem to really dodge projectiles so consequently, this was pretty easy. As is tradition, I managed to get up to Sister Frida while this wolf relentlessly chased me across half the map. Seriously, this has got to be the most persistent doggo ever. With the lever turned, I was curious to see if I could shoot Father Ariandel in the head, but sadly, it did no damage to him. It was enough to annoy Sister Frida it seems. Now using a bow for phase 1 has the added bonus that the arrows show you where the sister is when she disappears. Getting shots in when she's moving or attacking also does more damage which is handy. As for phase 2, it's finally time for the poison arrows to shine. Sort of. Father Ariandel is so weak to poison that even though the arrows have very low poison buildup, it's still worthwhile getting the poison here. As a result, this again isn't too bad but as we know, phase 3 is where things get real. No more getting greedy with the freedy here, one shot every now and then is all I'll have the chance to do. Things were going okay until the very last moment, she caught me with the grab attack when I misjudged a shot. I was sure that it was game over but I survived with a fraction of health and managed to recover, lay in the last few shots and bring an end to this twisted sister. I should probably try and make myself actually look like a skillful player in one of these videos. Well, let's finish off the second DLC so we can move on to the next cycle. The great thing about this DLC are the upgraded rings, such as the steel protection ring plus 3 near the start. We make our way down, do this danger jump to easily kill this angel and then grab the ring of favor plus 3 from the swamp. Well, I suppose it's time for the twin demons. This probably won't be so bad, right? Well, damn, I guess I underestimated them. <laughs> These guys have some serious damage resistances, some of the highest in the whole game. As always, the demon in pain must die first to make phase 2 a bit easier. It took 5 minutes just to get through this first phase, so you know that phase 2 is going to be even longer. The most annoying attack by far is the large homing fireball that he throws when he jumps backwards. I find this pretty difficult to avoid and I got popped by this a lot. The damage we do is absolutely pitiful and this was a pure endurance fight. It was 8 intense minutes of fighting this phase, making this 13 minutes in total. I was out of heals at the end and I'm kinda shocked. In principle, this fight shouldn't have been that tough but in practice, this was hell. Can't wait to do this 2 more times with even slower attack modes. We do all the usual stuff to get through this area and finish up by popping Madeira in the face and grabbing the Chloranthi ring plus 3. So next is the bane of most Dark Souls 3 challenge runs, Half Light. I was actually online when I got here and surprisingly I twice got to fight actual players and then shortly after remembered why I hate PvP. NPC Half Light was also bad. I actually learned something here, I didn't realise that you can end up with two Ian the Painting Guards in the fight if you don't kill the first. I decided to focus solely on Half Light and yeah it was a really bad call, Ian the Painting Guard needs to be killed ASAP. Given that dodge shots weren't helping too much, I broke out the Dragon Rider bow again and killed the first Ian pretty speedily thanks to interrupting his heal. Now for our main boy. The best chance to hit him is when he's charging up the shockwave with the frayed blade. After enough hits, we got half health down to half light and then the second Ian joins the fray so I focus my fire on him. With him gone, I end up switching back to the composite bow for faster fire. I th think this helped. At the end, I actually used the rapid fire weapon art to end this painful endeavour. The difficulty really feels like it spiked with these last two bosses. Comparatively, Medea was actually pretty easy, I got more damage from my arrows to his head than with either of those last two. Sure he has way more health, but most of his attacks are pretty easy to avoid. I did die once due to getting caught by the laser, but overall this was fine, just dodges attack, 
shoot the head, repeat. Next up, one cracked egg and an epic pullback camera shot later and we can at last take on the final boss of this part of the run. This was also actually the longest. We're back to doing pretty bad damage and Gale has only a little bit less health than Medea, but at this point, I do know Gale's moves pretty well. I was literally just going for one shot at a time and consequently the final phase took absolutely forever. The entire fight was 14 minutes long and yeah, I really felt it in those last few. Another endurance test for sure and I was actually out of heels at the end. One final arrow is the last gale in the coffin for this boss and for the bow section of this run. Now, I had wanted to use Gale's soul for something for the next run, but I forgot that I never spoke to Transposition Dude at all in this run, so he's not actually here. Oops. So instead I get the Knight's Crossbow, buy a whole bunch of different types of bolts, and then upgrade the crossbow to plus four. Just like all crossbows, there's no scaling, so that's good. Worth noting, I will allow myself to carry over any upgrade materials I've picked up on my travels, but I'm not allowed to specifically buy loads of them from the Shrine Handmade just to try and make things more interesting slash unnecessarily difficult. Let's get the crossbow run underway. So this bow actually has lightning damage and FromSoft really likes it when you use ammunition that matches your weapon's element. That damage is pretty good. Two hits to kill these new game plus hollows. Wait, is that good? I actually don't even know. One good thing compared to Dark Souls 1 is that you don't need to reload right away. You can dodge away and then reload in a safe spot at your leisure. Well, let's see if we can flex on new decks. Using normal bolts, the damage is pretty bad. With the lightning bolts, it's almost twice as much, so just use them, right? Well, the problem is we can't purchase more of them until quite a bit later, so I was hesitant to go too crazy with them. But at this point, any progress was good, so I just went for it to get the Udextra damage and ended this fight fairly quickly. I get to Firelink, went to Ludleth, and of course I don't have the transposing kill now. Great. As the damage against Gundir was already not looking great, I upgraded the crossbow to plus six with the large titanite I had on me and then went on to the high wall of Lothric. I painfully killed a dog with the crossbow and then got the key and grade free rat from his cell. Against our next boss, a botched dog from the Warrior Valley, I couldn't afford to make any mistakes because our damage here is, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty awful. I'm sensing a theme here. It's worth noting here that in New Game Plus, Vought has more than three times the health he had in New Game, but our crossbow of course doesn't scale, meaning even at plus 10, we're not going to be pulling out much damage. This wasn't too bad overall, but it felt like it took ages even though it was only about five minutes. This doggy rolls over and we glide on down to the undead settlement and one step closer to getting that transposing tilt. We grab Loretta's bone and I chat with Sigurd. I decided to do his quest on each cycle because I'm going to allow myself one Sigurd use for Yorm across this run if I absolutely need it. Now, I thought this fight against Great Woodrow Wilson was going to suck, but it wasn't as bad as I thought. I had bought exploding bolts before moving to this cycle and now seemed like a good time to use them. I actually free aimed to pop the ball on his hand first and then got the ones between the legs. For phase two, Popping the balls between the legs again is the easiest target, and surprisingly, I can get the ones on its back also. He helps me a lot by stopping to do the butt slam. With these popped, he had a tiny amount of health remaining, and with a nice free aim at the hand, this tree leaves this mortal plane. So now, we can finally get what I wanted, the repeating crossbow from Gale's soul. On a normal crossbow run, you wouldn't get this until right near the end of the game without editing it in, but here, we can use it early on. I mean, it's literally created using the soul of the true final boss of the game, so I'm sure it's going to be awesome, right? I've got enough scales to get it to plus 3 now, and I'm only too short from getting it to plus 4. I throw Green Rat a bone while I'm here, and then heading back to Cemetery of Ash to get another Titanite scale from this roided up Crystal Lizard. Now, the main thing I was excited for with this crossbow was the weapon art that fires 10 bolts in rapid succession. I tried it here, and the damage was… well, underwhelming would be an understatement. For the fact 10 bolts are being used in this attack, each one does very little damage and they're firing all over the place in pretty inaccurate fashion. I mean, we still take it down, but I used up like nearly 80 bolts to do so. Is this really all this crossbow has to offer? Okay, okay, but it is only plus 3. Maybe if I get it upgraded to max we can squeeze out some better damage. I head on to Farron Keep, ladder cheese all these NPC guys, put out all these fires and then take out another ravenous Christy boy to get the scales I need. So now, with this and a slab carried over from the previous cycle, the repeating crossbow is now maxed out at plus 5. While here, 
We send our boy White Rat off on his first journey. Good luck, buddy. Well, I haven't tried out the normal shots from the repeating crossbow, so let's see what they do on this boreal knight. Wow. At plus five, this is the damage the weapon you get from the strongest boss in the game does. Well, to try to take my mind off my disappointment, let's go help our boy Sigurd and easily take out this demon to move his questline along. There's not much left to do, but take on some bosses. Given how awful the Crystal Sage was on New Game Plus using miracles, I was pretty sure this was going to be terrible. And I was right, the damage is low and the second phase is just a barrage of magic and my slow fire rate leaves me pretty open. Despite all my rage, I still die to a hat wearing sage. So in phase one, I actually did find the weapon art was handy. I mean, I definitely do more damage just firing 10 bolts normally, but this is a lot faster at least. For phase two, I have to take out the clones. Ignoring them is not an option. The weapon art is pretty helpful here as the sage teleports pretty quickly after we hit him. So getting him max damage in a short amount of time was key to victory. This was still very close though. I had no FP, no Estus left, and was at less than half health at the end here. It probably wasn't as painful as doing it with miracles, but that's probably just because I had more experience at this point. As we've beaten a boss, Yellow Rat now returns, and he's got some new ammo for us, such as the sniper bolts. We head on to the Cathedral of the Deep, do the stuff with patches, and get CG's armor back. But now, we're about to dive deep into hell. Deacons of the Deep. I could already tell this was going to make me regret doing this run. Slow fire rate. Low damage makes even the first phase hell. The weapon art wastes way too much ammo for this fight. I came to realize that Gale's crossbow alone wasn't going to get the job done. So what to do? Well, I realized that I had picked up the Arbalest, which at max upgrade should do more damage per shot than Gale's crossbow. But unfortunately, I don't have the upgrade materials, so there's only one thing for it. Yep, gotta do Dancer because Deacons are too difficult. Comparatively, this was a lot easier. Smashing 10 boots right into a bolty does some sort of decent damage. Honestly, Dancer is pretty straightforward with ranged builds apart from a few attacks that give you the illusion of safety in phase two. Also, a cheeky ember near the end helps. As much as I've said I find Gale's crossbow underwhelming, the weapon art does speed this up for sure given how small the damage from each single shot is, so it's a good answer for Dancer. I level up and get ready to go get some large shards and chunks. Large shards from killing the knight over and over and then I activate all the shortcuts and grab the chunks in the area above. All this gets the arbalest all the way up to plus 10 and I make myself look really fashionable for extra motivation. Dual wielding crossbows lets you fire both of them one after another which is pretty cool. Back to the deacons. The dual wield helped me get through phase 1 but phase 2 was an even worse issue. I thought the repeating crossbow's weapon art would still help with phase 2, but as well as being smashed by fireballs constantly, the curse buildup is a huge problem as the casters are quite tanky and I even ran out of ammo because of using the weapon art too much. I think it's worth mentioning here the huge HP increase the deacons get from new game to new game plus. More than double! After a brief break to do all the necessary Seagwood stuff, I dove right back in, this time making use of some alluring skulls to try and help thin the herd. Even with this, it took so many shots to kill the curse casters and even downing one doesn't delay it for that long. Just look at this mess at the end here. This curse attack forces you to try to take out either the casters or the main deacon as fast as possible and taking things out quickly is literally not possible with crossbows. Using just the arbalest kind of seems better at this point for more straightforward and consistent damage. I tried to think what else I could do. Maybe using Lloyd's sword ring to get more damage? Well it's like... 40 points more damage and I'm rarely ever at full health so that's no good. Also, let's not forget about these blue guys healing the main guy just to extra ruin my day. This was, legitimately, one of the most frustrating fights out of any of these New Game Plus runs that I've done. I then remembered one thing that I had completely overlooked. I had exploding bolts. I bought them before I moved to New Game Plus. These bolts explode and actually damage more than one deacon at once. With this in my arsenal, it did help me to do enough damage to the casters and stagger away the deacons surrounding them, but in the end, it still didn't help as I ended up not being able to shoot the main guy in time to stop his mega projectile. On the actual winning attempt, I used the exploding bolts in phase 1 to thin the herd for phase 2. Then, I just started using alluring skulls right away and manually aiming the crossbow to shoot the Pope. I would get two shots in and then quickly throw another skull and repeat. Somehow, 
Despite the fact they were chanting and casting, the curse never started. Maybe because I somehow managed to execute this quick enough? In any case, finally, after many, many, many attempts, I bury the Pope and his decoys six feet deep. I really hope there's nothing as painful as this in the future for me. Oh, hey, some robes that I'll never wear. You shouldn't wear them either, but one thing you should do is click that subscribe button. We're aiming for 100,000 subscribers this year, and currently only 7% of people watching are subscribed. I promise you, you'll see me go through more hell like that Deacon's fight if you do. But anyway, there is absolutely no respite though, as, being that they're a mandatory boss, we can't amiss the Abyss Watchers. Now, although this is kinda a multi-enemy boss fight, this was nowhere near as bad. I went back to Gale's repeating crossbows, for some reason I was determined to get more use out of this thing. In its defence, there were points where I landed the weapon art up close, and it did a lot of damage. Although that's kinda offset by the fact that the damage of the normal shots is so much lower than the arbalest, and the ammo drain from the weapon art is staggering. I actually nearly ran out of ammo here, but luckily, returning to just normal shots did the trick. I then made my way steadily through the catacombs of Carthus. I even managed to get the hat-wearing skeleton to take himself out with his own skele ball. I've talked a lot thus far about the weapon art of the repeating crossbow, but I haven't yet mentioned the weapon art of the arbalest, which for some reason is a tackle. A tackle that breaks bridges even if crossbow bolts can't for some reason. After technically killing the Salathus worm with a giant crossbow, I easily smoked the old Demon King. Really, this guy sucks against all range builds, and getting slain easily by the repeating crossbow is really demonstrative of this point. As for the High Lord, hitting his wristbands with crossbow bolts actually wasn't too difficult as long as I was well near enough to his arm. I kept a close radius, and with a few blasts of the weapon art, this skeleton returns to the afterlife, or whatever the hell down there is supposed to be. Now that we can enter Irithyll, we can also send our boy Blue Rat off on another expedition. After taking out these Irithyll knights, I decided that this was the end of using the repeating crossbow, and switched to using the arbalist full time. The lower damage and ammo hungry weapon art weren't going to cut it in New Game Plus, and I needed all the advantages that I could get if I was going to get through here. I made my way to the Church of Yorshka, and fulfilled an important criteria to keep Brown Rat alive. Totally ghosting Sigurd. Yes, I know you can also mess around with patches, but this was much easier. By not talking to him, Sigurd doesn't move on from here and stays to help Grey Rat survive the sewers. Given how much the stay away from Hell sucks normally, I wasn't going to waste any time here, so ran through very quickly, throwing shade at some pale invader, and opening the shortcut door as quick as possible to then prepare for Pontiff Sullivan. Given the range of the crossbow, it's actually a great strategy at the start of the fight to just shoot at him from the doorway, which serves as a great sull vantage point until he gets too close. Phase 2 is a slow and steady sesh. What's interesting is that the shadow doesn't dodge projectiles, while the real pontiff does, so it makes it actually quite easy to kill off the shadow, even if he does bring it back again. In the closing moments, I got some good luck with the attacks they chose, and was able to keep them separated, and show him the pontiff that keeps on giving giving not that great scaleless damage, that is, but hey, we move forward. With a boss defeated, Turquoise Rat returns safe and sound thanks to Sigurd's help, and has some new bolts available for purchase. Now, with some NPC-type enemies up ahead, I was determined to find a use for the tackle weapon art. I tried to tackle this guy off, but, uh, but on second try, I totally nailed it, and tackled him off the edge for a satisfying kill. Yep, absolutely perfect. Up in Anor Londo, Terry the Spider gets shot in the face repeatedly and doesn't do a damn thing about it, and then Aldrich spammed the arrow rain about 300 times in a row, which was, suffice to say, slightly annoying, but he devoured some of my bolts shortly afterwards. This boss never seems too challenging even with this crappy crossbow. I do my best Tony Stark impression, and just like Iron Man 3, Aldrich gets Killian. I start levelling up strength now in preparation for the Great Bow Run, and then send Aqua Marine Rat off on his final mission, of course making sure to stock up before he goes, as we won't be able to access his stock again until the Grand Archives. We blast through Irithyll Dungeon, getting the Jailer's Key on the way for possibly saving Sigurd, and make it to Yorm's closest bonfire, while being chased by another insanely persistent four-legged creature, but thankfully I was able to escape from that rat race. Now, I wasn't sure if I wanted to use my one use of Sigurd against Yorm here, as I didn't know how bad the Great Bow Run would be, so I backed up my save and tried Yorm without Sigurd first. 
Really, this attempt was just to gather some information about what the damage levels would be, as Yorm has a lot more health in New Game Plus. Nearly 14,000 more, in fact. I genuinely thought going into this that ammo would be an issue, but actually, it was less bad than I imagined. Landing a headshot does nearly 350 damage, and of course shooting his head when he staggered nets a nice four-figure number. If you thought the bow fight was long, this one took 23 minutes. 23 minutes, 16 of which were the second phase because of how few the opportunities are to hit the head. The crossbow shots often miss as Yorm moves his head slightly. It was a massive endurance test, but by some insane miracle, I defeated Yorm here on my first try. I head back to the Consume King's Garden to first cheese up these really annoying knights and then fight the Crossbow Dragon. Why Crossbow Dragon, you ask? Well, because he's scaleless. It. Weirdly, I've actually become kind of good at dodging that charge, even though there's no wind-up to it. I pretty much just assume he's going to do it if he's just done an attack and he's a little distance from me. I take my time, chipping his health away bolt by bolt, and the penultimate one actually gets a stagger, allowing me to finish him off. I actually realized right after this that I should focus on getting Grey Rat's Ashes from the Grand Archives so I can buy ammo again, so back to Lothric Castle I go. I had a half-baked idea to shoot these fire-breathing tosses from here with the crossbow bolts, but after seeing that damage, I thought I'd be pointlessly dragging the run on. Also, I forgot I actually did unlock the lift shortcut when I came here earlier. Oops. So, now to bring harm to this armor with my armament. Oh, wait, sorry, wrong video. The obvious problem here, as with any projectile build, is that shield, but after the bow run, I kind of know the windows to attack now. As with pretty much all the fights in this run, it's long, drawn out, and requires a lot of running away and patience, but eventually we get it done. With access to the Grand Archives, I run past these handwritten books, unlock the shortcut elevator, and find the right place on the rooftops to grab Rainbow Rat's ashes. You will be missed, friend. But there is something else that might be useful here. Our old friend from Dark Souls 1 archery run, the Avalin. This weapon fires three bolts at once, but with lesser damage on each than the Arbalest. In Dark Souls 1, this was pretty useful, but given the last multi-shot crossbow we tried in this game, my expectations are cross low. They say, as well as the traditional sitting position, meditation can also be sometimes achieved by completing a repetitive task. Well, it doesn't get much more repetitive than this. While repeatedly mashing the R1 button, I was able to open my third Ivern and achieve Dragon Nirvana. On the way to grab the Dragon Chaser's ashes to buy high level upgrade materials, I suddenly had an epiphany. I figured out a good use for the tackle weapon art on the crossbow. Are you ready for this? For King of the Storm, I gave the Avalin a go, and just as I expected, the damage from three bolts was not good. It was only slightly more than just one bolt from the Arbalest, so yeah, I might come back to it later, but this is not the fight for it. Shooting King of the Storm's head was simple enough, shame I can't really take advantage of the stagger. As for Nameless King, well the damage wasn't great, which I guess I expected after all this. But he does like to just walk there while I shoot him repeatedly. I think I know why he just stood there taking those bolts though. He thought I was shooting him with strands of his favourite pasta. You know, Guinguini. This was definitely not the cleanest fight against him though. I got greedy and I went for too many shots. But victory was still fairly straightforward and after many more bolts, Nameless King went down on the first try. That only leaves one other optional boss in the base game, in the Untended Graves, where unfortunately the tackle didn't save me from being ganked in a corner. Well, gun deer we are again. I was determined to beat at least one boss with the Avalin, and Champion Gundir seemed as good as any. Firing at just the right time when he charges to headshot stagger him is pretty satisfying. Shame that only happened like once though. His aggression always makes it hard to heal, and one wrong dodge takes a lot of health. He also has way more range than you think, so often, when I feel I'm at a safe firing range, it turns out I'm actually not. I almost feel like Gundare is at times a precursor to the Elden Ring boss design as I find a lot of his moves have big delays designed to catch you. In the end, we fire off enough mini javelins and bring his health to zero, scoring the victory. I restock on many bolts and grab another slab from under the elevator near the Twin Princes and then go on to take on uh, the, the Twin Princes. You all know by now that Phase 1 is laughable with range, but Phase 2 becomes very tough. 
I literally started by trying to just get behind and shoot Lothric, but this proved tricky to actually land hits. I prepared what I believed was a really solid strategy for the next try. I ran through all possible combinations in my mind as I worked through phase one. I landed the hit that pushed the fight to phase two and, oh, um, never look at gift prints in the mouth, I guess. Okay, but for the final hit, I'll actually kill Lorien first so that it's a bit more epic. Oh, I feel like they got Lothric rolled there. Right, well, let's go chin off the base game. God damn crossbows. Soul of Cinder this time, used the spear phase a lot in phase one, and honestly, I was okay with it. I actually dodged a lot of it, which I was happy with, because normally I get skewered like an ash kebab repeatedly whenever I encounter it. The damage, as always, was pretty poor, and our shots were infrequent, but we got through. By swiping right on the Cinder app, the next profile I saw was a Gwyn cosplayer who I entertained initially, but upon noticing most of the photos were taken with misleading angles and featured him with other people, I once again swiped left by jamming several crossbow bolts into his sternum while he did the multi-hit combo. With that, the base game is all finished and we jump into this painting to get to Frappe Snowland. We make this guy sit bolt upright, tackle the air around this bridge to knock it down, and then I almost made it down the branch drops first try with a number of close calls, but in the end, choked at the last minute. Speaking of choking, have a look at this mess in the grave tender fight. What the hell was that? Second try, things went smoother. Given how difficult it is to actually hit the grave tender, I found it easier to take out the wolf first here, as surprisingly, it doesn't dodge projectiles. Fighting the NPC is a grave undertaking, and honestly, I feel like this was RNG whether he decided to dodge my shots or not. Thankfully, there were enough times where he just chose not to, and with that, I wish goodbye to this boss until the next cycle. Definitely a strong contender for the worst DLC boss. After cheesing the Croverine, we made it to Wilhelm, and I knew exactly how I wanted to handle him. Can you tell what I'm thinking? Sadly, he didn't want to play ball, and turns out the Dark Hand is a one-shot. So, yeah. Okay, we'll get him this time. I don't think that was due to me, but I'll take it. I think he let out a Wilhelm scream as he fell. As always, this wolf chased us all the way up to Sister Frida's place. I thought I'd have some fun and see what happens if the wolf attacks Frida and... Ah, she's gone. She doesn't even appear in the cutscene when you turn the crank downstairs. But after using a homeward bone, she reappears and talks to you like nothing happened. Weird. Frida came down to a sister friend, Father Ariandel, and we went to work. Now what was very strange was that I predicted this last gauntlet of bosses was going to be tough, given that this had been difficult on the bow run, but surprisingly, the five remaining bosses all went down first try. The first two phases of Sister Frida leave more than enough windows to get hits in. Sure, it's slow, but as long as you're patient and keep your distance, it's not too much an issue. I did initially try the splintering bolts for Ari and Del, as I remembered how weak he was to bleed, but the bleed buildup of these bolts was so minimal that it took way too many to proc even one bleed to make it worth it. Phase 3 is a different story, but I had a secret weapon I'd saved for this, exploding bolts. They do good damage and stagger Frieda as well, but at some point during this fight, I got really flustered. I got caught by the grab, which I only survived with a tiny bit of health. Luckily, I'd used an ember so I was able to pop that to heal myself to full and get a bit more health on top. Due to that and some other costly mistakes, Frida had about half health remaining and I was down to just one Estus left. I nearly let her get off that mega projectile after she goes invisible, but luckily got her at the last second with an exploding bolt. It came right down to the wire, but thanks to some counter damage while she was darting towards me, I brought her health low and, although I was a Frida that I might choke, she goes down after a 15 minute fight. All right, no more messing around. I blast into the second DLC, quickly take out both angels and challenge the twin demons. This had given me quite a bit of trouble in the bow run, but I had definitely learned from that encounter. With phase one, I found waiting for that brief window where they're both de massively helped and allowed me to turn the demon in pain into the demon in even more pain. When they both enter the aggressive state, I mainly just ran away as it's not worth risking trying to get too many shots out. Once the demon in pain is done, taking out his bellowing brother is no issue. For the demon prince, I knew the damage was going to be bad, but wow, that is next level terrible. The process remains similar here though. It's really important not to get greedy and run out of stamina, as that is a distinct bad time if you can't dodge his attacks. From a distance, he often does the flying charge or jump attacks a lot, which aren't too bad to avoid, 
and of course the laser just means run around to his side as quick as possible. With how high his damage resistances are, this fight is a real endurance test, but I didn't want to die and again somehow eked out the win first try. If there was one boss I was really worried about though, it was definitely Half-Light. Two NPCs both loved to dodge bolts. After taking out both Ian the Painting Guards, Half-Light had nearly full health and I had just two flasks remaining. But the weirdest thing happened. He didn't dodge that many bolts. It's weird because I remember on the magic runs, he just relentlessly dodged. But here, although he dodges some, there's a lot that he just doesn't. I think part of it was he kept using the shockwave weapon art a lot, and while he's firing it off, he's unable to dodge. Maybe I got lucky, but I'm not complaining as I spear the spear of the church in the church for the victory. Hey, my dear, wake up, sleepyhead. Time for school. I... Wish I had something more interesting to say about this fight, but it was pretty easy. Just shoot the head a lot, especially in the side of it so your bolts go right inside his mid-ears. It was 13 minutes of one or two shots, and eventually he goes down, leaving just one boss left to be crossbowed. Before this, I went and grabbed the Dragon Slayer Great Bow for the Great Bow Run, and then proceeded to the final challenge. So, Slave Knight Gale. This was pretty similar to the Bow Run, but actually probably a bit easier. We actually did a bit more damage, which I don't really understand, not much obviously, but it's a little more, and Gale has next to no health increase from new game to new game plus. As we wrap this up, let me just say, the crossbow overall was better here than Dark Souls 1, just because of not being forced to instantly reload and stay locked in place, making the fire time pretty quick and giving me time to get to safety before I reload. But saying that, Deacons of the Deep was still one of the worst things I've ever done. It'd be pretty awful if the thing I had to fight these fast-moving bosses with forced me to stand in place for a big period of time, though. Anyway, after 12 minutes of playing this Gale shooter, he goes down, and we buy a ton of great arrows before moving on. Hopefully I don't run out, I've got no idea how this is going to go. One more round of setting myself on fire, and we're on the final cycle. With our trusty Dragon Slayer Great Bow, and some great arrows which we can only carry 50 of at a time, let's take on Udex Gundir for the final time. So there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is the damage is pretty decent. You could even describe it as great. Way better than anything we've seen so far per shot, probably due to the fact we've got scaling again. The problem is the firing speed. It is by far the slowest, not just in pulling back to wind up the shot, but it seems to leave you locked in place for some time after which is not ideal. There's a weapon art that does even more damage and could shoot through multiple enemies, but the wind up for that is even longer. I really wanted to see the extra damage here, but it took several minutes to find an opening to even land it once, and when I finally did, we got a grand total of 37 extra damage. Awesome. You'd extraordinary, some might say. Anyway, the boss is dead now. With access to Firelink, we go to upgrade to get some Andres. The Great Bow uses Twinkling Titanite, which I haven't used for anything yet, so thankfully I've got lots of it. I upgraded the bow to plus 4 for now, let's see how we get on. Crimson Rat again is pretty important here for acquiring ammunition later, so we make sure to free him before we take on a boss that was not as easy as advertised. It's undeniable that the damage is good, but as well as the firing speed, another issue with the Great Bow comes to light here. How much stamina firing a single shot uses? I've been upgrading endurance a decent amount I thought, and yet each shot consumes about 70% of my stamina bar. What this means is if my stamina isn't almost full, I can be left with no stamina after I fire, meaning an even larger opening for my foes to take advantage of. Now, this isn't as much of an issue with Vought, as he has certainly some very large windows for us to fire, such as his three charges in the second phase, but we still did get caught here, and I can see this being an even bigger issue as this section of the run continues. But anyway, that's for future JK to worry about. For now, we grab the banner and descend down to the Undead Settlement for the last time. If you watch my Dark Souls 1 equivalent of this video, you might remember how I couldn't really aim down with the Great Bow. Well, watch this. How the hell does that make any sense? I, I mean, it's great for me, obviously, but that's literally defying the laws of wondrous physics. I met up with everyone's favorite layered vegetable. I think I just figured out why he's an onion, because he's so appealing. Anyway, we took down this wandering demon. The damage from the Great Bro is pretty awesome, like absolutely dwarfs anything we've seen so far, and with an enemy where I have a helper to keep them busy, this was no trouble. I still haven't decided whether I will use Siegwood later for Yorm or not, but good to have options. Now, 
Can you think of a boss at this point in the game that might be painful with a weapon that fires this slowly? God damn, I hate this boss. This boss makes me want to crash a car. That's right, it gives me road sage. Nah, I'm just kidding. I, I, I can't drive. So, it goes without saying, damage is excellent, and even though avoiding damage is difficult, we manage to get through phase 1 relatively quickly. But phase 2, everything goes to hell. The magic spam is relentless at points, and I often felt it was only by pure luck that I managed to get a shot off to kill the clones. The sage teleports after one shot, and brings the clones back, which isn't ideal. I opted to stand in the corner waiting for them to appear, so I could at least take out one clone quickly. For my one shot on the sage, I used the weapon art for that tiny bit of extra damage. But as they teleported again, something interesting happened. I shot the real sage this time, and it teleported, and the clones disappeared, which is pretty normal. But then the sage reappeared in the opposite corner of the arena to me, where I shot it again. This time, it teleported, but just reappeared in the exact same spot, and it repeated this again. I'm not sure if I just got lucky that it happened to go back to the same place multiple times, but this allowed me to get the job done and end this painful fight. Now, we all know what's up next, and given how much pain I had experienced during the crossbow run, I wanted to ensure I had every advantage possible. So, controversial routing, I went into the Painted World DLC early. There's two things we want here. First, I head to this area of the DLC that I basically never go to because there's usually no need. We climb up this tower to get the Captain's Ashes, which means the Shrine Handmaid will now sell the Millwood Great Arrows, the best Great Arrows in the game. But nearby here, we can also grab the Millwood Great Bow, which is going to be our endgame weapon. I didn't want to mill in this wood any longer, so I went on back to stock up on new Great Arrows, which we can only carry 30 of. Great. But anyway, I used Twinkling Titanite and a slab to max out our Millwood Great Bow, which has an A scaling in strength. This should mean the damage is even better than before. I wasn't quite ready to dive deep into the Deacons yet though, so I went to take on what I thought would be an easier boss. Turns out, trying to take out a pack of wolves and an NPC with a great bow tends to put you in a grave. On my next attempt, I was able to take out one of the wolves right away and managed to get a combo of good timing and good luck to take out the other two. Compared to the crossbow or just the bow, the great bow shots actually do okay damage to the grave tender even if he's blocking. His health isn't that high, so this does whittle him down fairly effectively. I was actually able to get three direct shots on him just before he summoned the wolf, leaving him fairly low on health, but trying to land more shots on him now while this wolf jets around at warp speed is not easy. It did only take two further shots to bring him down though, and after landing them, the rest of the fight was pretty elementary, as the wolf took a lot of damage, especially if you catch it as it charges. That's nearly 1000 damage. One last shot and the first of the annoying NPC fights is over with. I procrastinated for a bit trying to great bow the Crovarine, but deep down I knew what I had to do next. I needed to get to Irithyll so Yellow Rat could sell me some Dragon Slayer Great Arrows, and to do that, I had to beat the Deacons. So, I did all the stuff to get here, including all the crap with Patches and Sigurd. I was honestly absolutely dreading this fight, and yeah, the first few attempts were bad for all the reasons I thought they would be. The slow firing rate combined with the fireball spam made for a bad time. The damage was obviously far superior to anything the crossbow had been pulling out, by an enormous margin, and we could take out the smaller deacons in one shot in the first phase, making that at least kind of easy. But for phase 2, there was one other advantage the great bow had over the crossbow, the weapon art. With the Millwood great bow, the weapon art fires an arrow which not only pierces through multiple enemies, insanely perfect for this situation, but it actually has an even better advantage. You see, with the weapon art, any great arrows fired actually explode a second or so after they land. Often, this isn't useful as the arrows will normally fly until they hit a wall, usually far away from the enemy it's just pierced. But here, because the deacons are all standing in front of this large altar in the middle, the arrow will often finish its journey there and explode, damaging the archdeacon and some of the minions as well. Although I was initially hit by a spam of fireballs, I somehow managed to land two weapon art shots which was enough to decontaminate this area of these religious pests. This was a real W for the run, and I honestly breathed a deep sigh of relief after this. Back in Farron Keep, Heso fell after getting hit by my great arrows, and then the Elder Gru got run through. Comparatively, the fight with the Watchers was abysterically funny in how easy it was. The damage was huge, and they actually got knocked down in the first phase by the arrows. They become a bit more sturdy in phase 2, but they can still get staggered. As, of course, this is a JK Leeds run, I obviously nearly choked at the last second, 
but thankfully recovered and one final shot brings the Fire Slaughter of Cinder down on our final run. We of course smash through the catacombs and address the skeleton in the room which is of course Lord Walnir. Again, you'd think this would be pretty annoying and granted it was closer than the previous Walnir fights in that he actually summoned the skeletons and was about to pull out his sword, but thankfully free aiming at the bracelets let me get just enough shots in to send him tumbling back down into the darkness. I think if that shot hadn't done it, I would have been in trouble. I quickly do the last bit of Sigurd's quest, play murder fetch with this doggo and send Marunrat off on his next mission. I make sure to then not speak to Sigurd again here in Irithil and then, for maybe the first time ever, I got this invader to kill themselves with throwing knives. Incredible stuff. To get Orange Rat to return and provide me with that sweet Dragon Rider Great Arrow stock, I need to kill a boss and Pontiff seems as good as any. It was kind of similar to the crossbow run in that I ended up taking out the shadow because of Sullivan's sidestepping shot style. I at one point tried the weapon art and it hit Pontiff just as he launched himself. I took a hit of course, but it did over 1100 damage so totally worth it. After definitely not nearly choking right at the end, seriously what's wrong with me, I finished Pont off with a final shot to clinch this one. With Purple Rat returned safely, we've got all the ammo we need and we actually don't even need to send him off a third time. As there's literally no reason not to, I decided to do all the DLC right now to get what would probably be the most difficult stuff out of the way. Wilhelm was so scared he tried to escape into the ground, but eventually he took a big arrow to the face. Huh, no wolf chasing me this time, I'm actually kind of sad. The fight with Sister Frida was comfortably the most difficult of any of the runs. Choosing the wrong time to fire an arrow and being out of stamina is instant death in phases 2 and 3. Phase 1 is very easy as you can just snipe her from a distance with no issue, even knocking her down. For Phase 2, Ariandel as always is the prime target. The arrows do a cool 800 damage which is nice, but I need to ensure I'm at pretty much full stamina when I fire a shot as I need stamina to dodge. Shooting him when he's attacking clears 4 figures and we soon finish off Phase 2. Phase 3 however, things get a lot more difficult as many windows that would normally be fine to fire just leave us open for her to counter attack too easily. But if you manage to hold a shot in and fire as she charges towards you, the damage is huge. On one of her jumps, I managed to hit her and deal over 1200 damage. To the surprise of everyone including myself, I actually didn't nearly choke at the last minute and got two prime shots in on her to end this and gain my freedom from this fight. With zero time wasted, we head into the ring city and headshot this angel tumor. Unsurprisingly, the twin demons was probably the hardest to counter with them across this whole run. The first phase alone took eight and a half minutes to get through. When one of them is in aggressive mode, it's very hard to find a window to fire a shot off. I basically had to wait until they both went into passive mode to stand any real chance of getting some damage in. Now, with just one remaining, the only way I found to damage it without getting smacked was waiting for it to do the long charging combo roll through to get behind it and then I'd have enough time to fire a shot. Every other attack was too risky so it was literally just running away waiting for this one to move. Now for the Demon Prince which was another 10 minute fight in itself and also absolute pandemonium. Any time he's in front of you attacking is not a good time to fire unless you're far enough away when he does the charging strikes. The flying ground scrape is also fine as long as you start holding the attack button as soon as you finished your dodge. Lastly, the laser as always is a good opportunity for damage. This felt like it took forever and I used all the Millwood Great Arrows I had on me, but finally we took him down. I'd actually be really happy if I didn't have to do this fight again for a while. I Mary Poppins down into the city, level up a little, have some PTSD from the magic run, shoot this dragon in the mid-ear section and then shoot him in the head a whole bunch of times. Honestly, this really wasn't bad. The windows after his attacks are easily big enough for me to fire off a shot and actually that's some of the best damage I've ever done against Spideer in a single hit. I actually go through half the fight without even getting hit myself. When he staggered, I used the weapon art for that little bit of extra damage. A few more headshots and this mid-Iterranean beast is slain for the third and final time. Now I know what you're all thinking, Half-Light is going to suck ass and yes, but also no. It was kind of less bad than I had imagined. One thing that absolutely saves us is that the shivs the Ian the Painting Gods like to throw do not interrupt us from firing the Great Bow. Also, four shots is enough to kill Ian the Painting Guard. Just one on one with Half-Light, he sort of became half-witted and actually decided not to dodge many of our shots again. I even managed to hit him with the weapon art. With some free aim shots and also just waiting till he started an attack, 
we took Half-Light down on the second try. So that just leaves Slave Knight Gale. This isn't going to be too bad, right? Well, actually, behind the Crossbow Deacons, it was the second hardest fight in the whole run, and it's all because of Phase 3, but I'll get to that shortly. First, our damage is a lot less than we were doing to Medea, nearly half in fact, but obviously still way more than the bow or crossbow. Phase 1, he can actually be staggered by the great bow shots, and managing to hit him midway through his jumps is mega satisfying. Phase 2 is trickier, but after he does his jump attacks, there is enough time to get a shot in so it's not too bad. But then there's Phase 3. He becomes a lot more aggressive, and what would be a safe punish window in any other run just isn't because he can respond so quickly, and even if I land the hit, I'll still take damage as I'm locked into place after I fire. It took a lot of experimenting to find the one window where I could fire my shot and still have enough time to get away. When he jumps like this, he follows up with two further jumps after. As long as I can create enough distance after I dodge through his first jump, I have just enough time to draw my bow and fire a single shot before he recovers, leaving me just enough time to get away as he attacks again. It's still not 100% safe, as it can be hard to judge if I'm far enough away to not be hit by the third jump. It was a close fight, and with him one hit from death, I took a risk and attacked outside of my usual window, and luckily landed the killing blow, finally allowing us to pregale over the DLC bosses. That was really tough, but we did it. Now just the entire rest of the base game. First, it turns out the weapon art of the Great Bow can break bridges. I, I have no follow-up, I just thought you might want to know that. Old Demon King was such a joke that the easy victory put me in a state of eudaimonia following the hell I had just been through. It's almost sad watching this. What next? Yorm? So I could have used Sigurd here, but despite how exhausted I was at this point, I felt that I needed to go out on a strong performance, so I persevered to get the kill with just the Great Bow. For all the reasons mentioned about the Great Bow already, this was definitely the toughest Yorm fight of the run. Noticing a pattern here? It was much shorter than the crossbow run, mind you. That damage from headshots, even when he's not staggered, is immense. When he is staggered though, oh baby that's nice. But the downside is if you're not stood in the exact right position, the arrow hits the side of his head and you don't get the full damage during the stagger. Still decent though. The most difficult part is just hitting the head at all while he's standing and it becomes even more difficult in phase 2. There are a lot of misses from me or just hitting non-head parts of the body. The best time I found was as he stands up from the two-handed machete slam, but you have to time it just right. For some reason, we got three staggers in a row despite the fact I only shot him once each time. I'm not really sure why that worked, but it got the job done, and we did it! No need for Sigurd at all, Yorm beaten on all three runs with just archery. Honestly, many of the next few bosses really weren't an issue after the DLC and Yorm. Aldrich was a little annoying, but our damage was so high compared to his HP that this was a relatively quick fight, and we take it down before we Aldrich hike our way back to Lothric Castle to take on the dancer of the Bow Real Valley. Twice. That's how many times that joke was used. Just twice. This was a bit tougher, and I did get nearly taken out at one point because Dancer can catch you with some pretty brutal combos. But thankfully, our damage is good enough to bring Dancer's health down swiftly, and we can dance on into Lothric Castle. Or we would be, but I felt like Arch Dragon Peak might be good to finish off first. I didn't even have to try Vern to finish off the Wyvern here, and then engage the Nameless King. I stormed the battlefield and took out his bird in rapid succession, leaving just the primary bread gwinner. Although he did catch me once or twice, he likes just walking towards you slowly too much for this to be that threatening. After a few short minutes, Nameless King falls. Back down to the Consume King's garden, and Osai Rospo is still pale, lanky, and has a texture that gives me the ick, but luckily he's not immune to being shot in the face with very large arrows. Despite the rapid speed charge, there are some windows large enough to land hits, so this wasn't too bad. But there were two bosses remaining that concerned me, and one of them was definitely Champion Run here, who loves nothing more than charging at you when you try to fire off a shot. Phase 2 is an absolute nightmare, trying to land a shot without also taking a hit often feels near impossible. In fact, Pretty much every hit I landed ended with me also taking one because I could just not find a long enough window to escape unscathed. I was worried we were going to run out of heals before finishing him off, but then the fight ended in a very unexpected way. He did the running overhead swing, and I fired just as he landed his hit, and it actually headshotted him at point blank range, finishing him off right then and there. He went from gun deer to gun down here. 
and then there were three. Dragon Slayer armor went about the same as the other three runs, honestly. The three hit combo is the best opportunity to attack, and our damage is way better than the other two runs. Dragon Slayer armor even kind of gave up at the end and tried to run away into a wall. Should have curled into a ball instead, like an armordillo. We beeline to the Grand Archives, and after a half-baked idea involving fighting all these enemies on the roof at once, I decided to stop tossing around and go and finish this brutal run. Now, remember I said there was another boss that was cause for concern? Well, that would be the Twin Princes. I was going to do it properly this time after that accidental cheese from last time which I dubbed Lothricotta. Phase 1 is pretty easy as always with range, just keep distance and fire. For Phase 2, I was banking on the weapon art, piercing through and hitting both of the princes at once, and while that did work, the damage Lothric took was actually pretty minimal. Thankfully, we had enough ammo to take down Lorien several times, and then get two arrows in on Lothric during the revival, which was good damage indeed. But unfortunately, the near last minute choke returns. There was a hairy couple minutes where I went from having seven Estus flasks to having none due to some panic dodges and getting caught by the teleport while I was trying to heal. But still, I got Lothric on very low health, although I took another hit. With the situation looking grave, I took a risk, used the weapon art from a distance, and the damage Lothric took was thankfully enough to deplete his health bar and end this pretense battle. This run has really taken it out of me. What a saga. We place the ashes for the last time and head on to face Soul of Cinder. To be honest, he was weirdly passive at points in phase one, so it was kind of easy to get hits in, especially during the sorcery phase. As for Soul of Gwinda, well, pretty much the only save times were the multi-hit combos or when he charges up the big lightning rain. I was patient and waited for either of those to land my shots, and with one last multi-hit combo, we are officially the sole warrior standing amongst a landscape strewn with arrows and bolts. I really underestimated this run. I had no idea this was going to present so many difficulties, but wow, this was really something. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and comment below to let me know about the Leo and Hawk rings and berate me for not using them. If you want to support the channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. We're aiming for 100,000 subs this year, and it would mean a lot if you decide to help that number along. I appreciate you regardless. Thank you for watching. I've been JK Leeds. See ya, and have a good one.